be seated in the presence of the Lord. This is the greatest honor of my life to be able to come back to the very place where I first drank the milk of the word of God and was first educated in the spirit to be able to bring um, the word of the Lord. I count it a rare privilege. I have uh, waited for this day for a very long time. I have seen the greats come. I've seen the blessings that the Lord has poured out. And I just imagined what it would be the first time I get the opportunity to share the word at the Master's Convention 2020. So this is history making for me. You, you have only one choice. You cannot hit. You must celebrate. <laughs> Amen. So much has been said. And... Um, it's been such a rich and powerful time in the presence of the Lord, but my time is so short, so short. Um, we would better just go to Romans chapter 8, verse, verse 37, and pray that the Lord gives me grace to an utterance to deliver this to the degree that he gave it to me. Romans 8, our anchor scripture um, Maybe we do a little bit of reading. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Let's read from verse 33 for the sake of context. Who shall lay anything to the charge of, the, of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God? who also maketh intercession hmm, for us, who shall separate us from the love of Christ, shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep. For the slaughter. Next verse. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Hallelujah. Through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. The word more than conquer. This conference has been, I have looked at the shape of this conference and it appears to me to be an equipping conference. God is equipping us by the word to face the future wars of the next season. God is equipping us by his word to be ready to stand guard and to come back with as many victories as we have battles. Somebody say amen. amen. And because it's an equipping conference, we'll slow down and just try to, to teach and to share a couple of things. The word more than conqueror is a phrase or a term of degree or scope or perimeters. Or measure. If you say you are more, the, the more in front of conquerors, the more before conquerors is trying to let you know, the, expose you to a scope, a measurement. And is using conqueror as the reference point for that description. So that where men consider conqueror to be the terminology for victory, more than conqueror puts a peg on the ground and makes conqueror the starting point, not the end. It's important to understand that more than conqueror is inviting us to something in the Holy Spirit that teaches us that what men call the best is where God starts. So that in our mindset and in our perspective to reality, we have the capacity the internal fortitude to never be limited 
by the things, the terminology, the nomenclatures that limit men. So that wherever they call their roof, we call it our floor. More than conquerors is telling us that there's so much more God is making possible for us that even conquerors don't know. It's inviting us to a level of faith where we are not satisfied with conquest. A dimension of spiritual possibility that considers conquest the beginning of the true Christian experience. Are you still there? It's important. So the, the real question is, what is more? Because he says we are more than conquerors. So if we are more than conquerors, who are we? What is we? What is we? More than conquerors. First thing that's important to understand is that every one of us under the sound of my voice was born into war. You and I are born into a battlefield of uncommon warfare. I've heard people come for counseling and say, I've had this dream, this experience, I've had these attacks, and I'm wondering what did I ever do to anybody? As though you will require to do something bad to be attacked in this life. They are counting on the pedigree of their niceness to others as the reason why they expect the good to happen to them. Have you heard comments like, why do bad things happen to good people? I see good people are qualified for good things because they are good. So why, why me? I'm that, by that me, with all my goodness to others, how come my goodness is not naturally occasioning good experiences? We're born into a war. In fact, the creation of man was occasioned by a battle, a cosmic battle that happened in the spirit of which God wanted to make a point in that battle. Mm. Let me come around. You must understand that whether your natural birth or your spiritual birth, all births within this planet is God's plan to reply a particular adversary of which he will be too big to respond to in his class as God. You will know that if you read the scripture carefully, you will never find anywhere in the Bible where any war or any battle in throughout human, human history required that God came on the scene to fight. The law of being God makes it unfair for him to appear at war because he is the self sustaining one. He is the reason. He is the only necessary being. He is the center of everything that has life. Every atom is holding another because he is in the center. So it will be unfair on any battlefield for God to show up because he is the creator and every other thing involved on the field are creation. So he would have broken a certain rule of his sovereignty if anybody was messing up and required God. Remember, the biggest enemy of the believer is, 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 is Satan, the devil. And when Satan stood up uh, and, and, and attempted treason, high treason in heaven, the Bible says it was Michael and not God's angels. It was Michael and his own angels. It was Michael and the angels of Michael that fought. If the greatest cosmic battle 
did not require that God rose up from his throne to fight it. There would be nothing else in human history that would require that God stood up. It would be unfair for God to be in the ring fighting a battle of creatures. So the technology by which God gets glory for himself, since it must not be heard that he appeared at war, because of his size and his strength and his glory, he had decided what he would do is he will make man that will be like him, representing him in another realm. So that through man, he can enter battlefields that it is wrong for him to show up at. You must understand this. The reason why when we are born again, we are given the Holy Ghost. And the, and the believer is the only creature that God can become. Have you ever thought about that? There's, not, there's nothing else in the universe of nature that God can become except man. It's because like a man puts his hand in a glove, God was looking for an opportunity to step down for once and get glory for himself. So when a cherubim fell from heaven with a third of the angels and came into the earth, God looked right, left, and center and said, Michael did heaven's war, but that's not the end of my conquest. I need another agency. By which, after I have displaced this ex-cherubim from heaven, I will make where he fell to also un as uncomfortable for him. So God went into the very earth that Satan fell to. And from the dust of the earth, he made man. And then he gave man dominion. Listen to the terms of dominion. The Bible says he blessed them. He said unto them, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, have dominion over fish of the sea, bird of the air, and over everything that creeps upon the face of the ground. The reason why this is the scope of man's dominion is not because of agriculture. The ability to tame animals so that you can multiply wealth. No, the purpose and the scope of this dominion is he used those terms to describe the three realms that are available within the earth sphere. When he said the fish of the sea, he was, he was speaking about every dominion, every throne that has marine as its element. When he said the birds of the air, he was giving man vice regency over every power that settles in the cadence of the atmosphere. And when he said over everything that creeps upon the face of the earth, don't forget that he's Alpha Omega. He knows that one of the judgments of the serpent in the garden that was to come at this time was that he will creep upon the face Amen. of the earth. So that no matter what form or style or realm our enemies take, God had already placed dominion over all three realms in the hand of the believer. So whether marine warfares, astral warfares, or warfares that are occasioned by the vicissitudes of the terrestrial realm, God had already decreed ahead of every battle that he will enter the astral realm through us for victory. It's important to understand we were made for war. Your, your build, your, your primary build, you were designed as a tool, a tool. God had a reply for Satan, and so he built. And so, you see, hmm, number two, it's important to understand that because God is too big to be found in any battlefield, and must not be found because he's creator, and his arrival will destroy any battlefield. There will be no battle when he comes. So there will be no victory. Because the battle will fossilize. It will evaporate. Nothing will exist when he arrives. And so the second thing you must understand about God and 
conquest, the way God thinks about battles, that's what I'm showing you. The way God conceives war. You must understand that as he built us as instrument, battle axes in his hand, he made sure that our external composition is built out of the most demeaning thing in the universe, dust. So that he can fill our internal environment with the most powerful element in the universe of nature, the spirit of God. Mm. I am describing this warfare tool to you. I'm describing, I'm describing you as an instrument of war in the hand of God. And I'm saying on the outside, you are dust, weak, dirt, broken. The things people wash off their feet when they want to feel clean. But on the inside, you are filled with things that angels look upon with marvel. The very Holy Spirit of God. So that tool, that tool that, that you are is a strange tool. Because when you look upon it, it looks weak. But when you engage it, it has all the powers and the forces of the universe behind it. That's why one of the keys to experiencing victory in your life is to never live according to the flesh. Because you were built on the external to be weak. For we have this treasure. Deliberately put. It's a treasure. Heaven considers it treasure. Among spirits, it's treasure. But it was placed in a vessel that is... That is what? That is hurting. So that God can enter battlefields unnoticed. The surface looks weak. He's not allowed. He's too big to fight. So he hides all of his powers between something that is, that is weak and that is broken. So when this revelation settles in your spirit, the first thing that should give you joy in life are your weaknesses. They are a proof of the opportunity God has to use you. Mm. Amount of time, and I haven't started this thing. <laughs> they are proof, they are proof, they are proof. The devil wants you to consider your weakness to be equal to limitation. But God wants you to see your weakness as his opportunity to come, to arrive on the scene. For if the princes had known, because of the way he came into the battle, it was so sublime. They had all the scripture. In fact, they quoted scripture back to Jesus to tempt him. But they, they, they did not know that they should not crucify. Which means that they should not tear the flesh. Because the Bible says he has consecrated for us a new and a, a living way that he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. So the princes did not know that if you tore the flesh, you will expose the treasure. Crucifixion is a way to wound the flesh. But God's tool for that battle was such that, hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. He veiled the most powerful thing in the weakest things. I've, I've had our father say before, he's, he's the one that goes to war when men ride on chariots and he rides on the back of the snail. And wins the battle. Because he is not God. If he uses what is qualified to fight. The enemy will shout foul. He is only God. If he can take the things nobody regards. Have you ever noticed that? Anytime you got a real promise from God, a real promise, the first thing that happens is that hell breaks loose. 
Have you ever noticed? Have you noticed that every time you're exposed to powerful prophecy that can recharge your life in six months and you, the joy, the joy of the spoken word fills your heart and you walk away knowing God is about to shift, shift things in your life. The first thing that happens is that hell. There's something about God that you must understand. If the devil does not contest for it, it will not be valuable in the spirit. So the first thing a true word from God does is that it allows the devil go. We are more than conqueror. Every time God used a tool that was qualified, it ended in trouble because any qualified tool will contest for the glory when the battle is won. And if God is jealous for anything, this is glory. So he has made up his mind. He will not fight until he can, until he can find something weak. Because when the, when the victory is won, the weak vessel will not be able to say, it was I! Everyone God used and got up and said it was I. God struck them immediately. Read the scripture. We don't have time. I can't believe I have 16 minutes to go. Every single one, read the scripture. He struck them. In fact, they didn't need to say it. If they thought it in their heart, he struck them. He's so sensitive to his glory. When he comes upon a Samson to destroy a thousand Soldiers that are covered in armor, he looks for the jawbone of an ass. And he gives it more power than steel of a thousand men. The jawbone of an ass. You are a weapon of war. You were born, you were occasioned. Your challenges were occasioned for somebody else's glory. God allowed what you went through because he was looking for a texture of glory that will not be available until you go through that level of war. Let's look at that scripture again. It says, Nay! In all these things, it says we are more than conquerors through him. That loved us. That word more than conqueror is the word hupa nikau. The word conqueror is nikau. Where, where you get the, the, the word Nike. How many of you have ever bought a Nike? Nike. A Nike shoes, Nike shirt. And it has this pass mark. And then they write on that, just do it. That word Nike is from the word nikau. Hupa is more. Nikau is conqueror. Nikau is where you get Nike from. And so when it says that we are more than conquerors, it's saying that we have vanquished more than what was necessary to establish our victory. Let's hurry. Who's a conqueror? A conqueror is one that defeats his enemy. But the modern conqueror is the one who, after defeating the enemy, subjugates the enemy. In the name of Jesus, everything that has battled us, battled your finance, battled your mind, battled your family, battled your purpose, on the strength of of the covenant of God that gave this team, I declare you are more than conqueror. Yeah. Who's a conqueror? A conqueror is one who has power to nullify the purpose of an enemy. Who is more than conqueror? The more than conqueror is one who can make the enemy serve his own purpose. Let everything 
that has battled your purpose now serve your purpose. A conqueror can strike down a foe. But a modern conqueror will make sure that his foe does not die. Because he intends to add that foe to his slaves. A conqueror wants to kill everything that attacks him. But a modern conqueror will add his enemies to his slave. Let everything that attacked you serve you. Let everything that attacked you in seasons past become a willing slave to you. That's why, although God has the option of killing our enemies, all of our enemies, for example, all of our enemies in Nigeria, how many of you know God has power to vanquish all Nigerian foes in one blast of nostril? How many of us believe it? The reason he has chosen a rather slower route (laughs) is because... He intends, rather than to kill the enemy, but to serve us a table in the presence of that enemy. He wants the enemy to live long enough to see the success they said we will never have. I hear the Lord saying to me, after today, this session, there will be no more narrow escape victories in your life. Every victory will be a landslide. Every victory will be a landslide. Every victory will be a landslide. The gap, the gulf between you and the adversary will be a landslide. Some of us have had experiences where we narrowly escaped uh, uh, accidents. You came out alive. The problem with coming out alive is that you, you live forever with the scar. That's the problem. You had a financial challenge. You came out. You, you narrowly escaped. More than conquerors, God is saying today, he's bringing us into a realm of divine possibilities. Yeah. Where our victories will be landslide. Yeah. They will be as clear as night and day. In the name of Jesus. Take your seats. Let's find, let's find where we can start to make some sense out of this thing. If you were to read Romans chapter 8 verse 37 in other translations other than the King James Bible, for example, the International Standard Version or some other version, you will understand something. If you read it in the ISV, it says, in all these things, we are in place for more than conquerors. It says, we are triumphantly victorious due to the one that loved us. And that's a powerful combination. We are triumphantly victorious. Say with me, I am, in the name of Jesus, triumphantly victorious. I want to solve a problem right now. And this is the problem. Too many people believe in Jesus, profess him as Lord and Savior, and they are sick. They believe in Jesus' ability to heal, but they are battling with sickness. Too many people believe in the power of the covenant to make rich and are struggling with penury. Too many people are living... The exact opposite of the memory verses they quote. They believe it in their head, but they don't have it in experience. More than conquerors is a code. Let's crack it. You see, that verse I read in the ISV says we are vic- triumphantly victorious. What it takes to be more than conqueror is the combination of victory and triumph. They are two different things. Until they meet, nobody imagines more than conquer. A victor has conquered. No more than conqueror is the one who is both victorious and triumphant. A 
at the time that this scripture was written, the early Christians understood it better than, than us now, except we study history because in that day, victory is what you get at the battlefront. When you win on the battlefield, in the days when men fight hand to hand and sword to sword, today everything is atomic, everything is nuclear, everything is on drones, everything. In those days, the real stature of a man when he holds a sword and enters the battlefield with, with a host, in those days, all you can get from the battlefield is victory. Nobody gets triumph at war. Triumph is not a warfare terminology. Triumph is more a legislative, legal expression than it is military. I'll prove it to you. When you fight an enemy and win the enemy, you are the victor or the winner. But it doesn't stop there. And that is why a lot of us have stopped at the cross. Because victory came to us at the cross. To be more than conqueror, you need to go beyond the cross. Because this scripture says, if you, if you read it carefully, it spoke about, about Jesus, the one who went to the cross. But much more than that, died and rose again. But much more than that, is seated at the right hand of the Father. And much more than that makes intercession for us. Arranging the passion and the glorification of Jesus in an order of importance. Are you still there? There is a problem. This is what I'm saying. There's a problem with a believer who embraces the cross and stays there. Because the one you are following is not at the cross. It's easy to enter religion. Because all you have there is a wooden, is a wooden sign. The cross was an icon. It was an entry road. It was the suffering through which he entered his glory. If you appear at the cross and receive the revelation at the cross, but don't follow the cross to the throne, you will have many victories in Christ, no triumph. Because the cross is an icon. You click it open to enter somewhere. He tore his body at the cross. It was torn and the veils were torn, which means the cross was saying, come into somewhere else. When the work of the cross was done, veils, accesses were open. The worst thing a believer can do to himself or herself is to make destination what God intended as transportation. You came in through the cross when you got saved, but your life is on the throne. You're supposed to live a reigning life. That level of triumph is not at the cross. Can, can we read this scripture? I, 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 know, I, know, I know I'm threading in, in difficult waters. Let's go back. Oh dear God me. Thank you, Lord. 34. I'm quoting 34 of Romans chapter 8. It says, Who is he that condemneth? It? it is Christ that died. Yea, rather. Are you still there? Yea, rather means dying was stage one. Yea, rather means dying was like climbing a staircase. When he put his first leg on staircase one. Yea, rather. Which means much more. He is so the believer starts his journey at the death of Jesus, apprehends everything the dead gave, and carries it to the next level. There is a different economy that the rising of Jesus brings that is not in the death. And you have called everything the same. That's why you don't have triumph. You don't know what he purchased at death that is unique from what he purchased at rising. This is not the service for it. Because he says he died, yea, rather, risen again. Then he adds even, which means in addition to dying and rising, he is even risen to the right hand, the highest of place. Then he says, he also, oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. He also, 
He make it. Let me tell you the most dangerous kind of intercession when God is talking to God about you. He says, he also. He says, he also. Oh my God. Oh my God. He also make it intercessions. Which means, before we get to the issue of more than conqueror, we must dissect what is the power of his death. What is the power of his resurrection? You remember the words of Paul? Yeah. What is the power of ascension? What unique thing did ascension bring into our space that we are supposed to apprehend daily? What is the joy of having Jesus seated at the right hand of God? What is the power of God talking to God on your behalf continually? Many of us don't know the value of revelation. Until you are face to face with a dog in a compound that you are trying to enter and the dog knows that you are not a member of the house. The dog is not going to bite you until he can sniff fear. Some hormones come out of your body when you are afraid that the dog can sniff. The dog is not sure how many people belong to this terrain. His only chance to know the difference between his owner, his master, and an intruder is that thing he smelt from you. That, because if you are afraid, then you are not one of us. He can't tell because his owners change dresses every day. He can't tell. So he sends you a notification. You call it backing. He's saying, prove yourself. I'm listening to your blood. <laughs> and then you're at the gate. You have entered the house. Then your, your legs start shaking. Then you start shouting to the people inside the house. Ah, the dog says, ah. And then he starts perceiving something from your body that, that is only occasioned by fear. And he says, ah, I've confirmed. I've, all the tests, I have run all the tests. This one cannot be from here and be afraid. And then he launches a bite. Many times we lose in life because we know God, but we don't have revelation of him. Your revelation will be checked because it does not say they that know God. It says those that know their God, which means a journey with God that makes God personal. Not God. You can know God and fail. You can know scripture and fail. You can... Daddy can lay hands on you until the front of your head is bowed. And fail. He can dip you in anointing oil and bring you out until you are looking like Kentucky Fried Chicken. And fail. Until what he does with you translates to something that is personal. Where God can now be named by your name. Where your life is an opportunity to give God a name. You see, one of the things difficult for God is name. It's difficult to name him. He can't, he can't name himself. So by our experiences, by our work with God, we immortalize, we carve, we archive a name. That's why if you read the Old Testament, you see every time men encountered God, they built an altar and gave it a a name, dimensionalizing his possibilities into smaller, smaller, smaller units that anybody who sees it can honor God. Because if he were to appear to you in all that he has and all that he is, there will be no context to name it. It will be too much. So in his wisdom, he has allowed us to experience him. And one of the things he wants to do by causing us to experience him is so that we can name what we experienced. Are you still there? There's so much more to say, but my time is up. So I will round up here. Find a way to round up. More than conqueror. More than conqueror. More than conqueror.
more than conqueror. I was describing to you that in the day that this scripture was written, nobody gets triumph on the battlefield. You get victory there, but not triumph. Triumph is only gotten by a ceremony that you, a feast that you gather after victory, where you use the spoil of war to grace yourself. You use your enemy to grace yourself. If you have chariots, you tie the strongest men, all the men that came to fight you. You don't kill everybody. There's some demons, there's some enemies in your life that must not die. If they die, God won't get glory. You tie them behind the chariots. And then you will climb the chariots. And then you will pull them. In a, in a stadium, in a coliseum, in, in, in the presence of all the women with their sons and the children and the men of war. And then the, the Bible says that it was he that ascended, the first descended. He led captivity captives. He gave gifts to men. If death, burial, and resurrection was, was enough, why did he still go back to heads that he came back from? To go and organize a conference in hell where he can show off the victory that he already got on the cross. It's because you need both victory and triumph to be more than conqueror. In some other Roman cultures, you will... You will chop off the, the thumbs of the kings that fought you. And you will tie them. And you will invite everybody to your throne. And you will arrange them like a king arranges footstools. And then you will put your head, your, your, your leg on their head. Then you will ask the best singers to sing your praise. While the heads of those kings. And, uh, Bible students are already doing some things in their head. Some scriptures are coming alive. Yeah, yeah, they're coming alive. Yeah. And so many of us, we know the victory. We know what Jesus has done. But we're still afraid because we have not learned triumph. Triumph means that there is, there is a procession you must join in the spirit that allows the victory come to you. The victory does not come to you automatically because it is finished. The victory comes to you because you have learned the law of appropriation. No amount of money you have in the bank can keep you from going hungry if you do not understand the law of deposit and withdrawal. You can die hungry. I mean, our father told us a story. I, yeah, every time I think about that story, I used to pity him. I'll just sit down, only me. I'll be pitying him. Travel to Singapore. And went to the Bible school. And they didn't really check the details of the payments because it was scholarship. See, part of the problem we have as Christians is because what we have, we got it free. The diligence to sit down and observe the profile of what we got so that we can execute it in life is the problem. And to make it worse, we are black people. They say we don't read. He wasn't exactly sure. He was happy about the scholarship. And the scholarship was good enough. I mean, somebody was going to fly you to Singapore and bring you back all expense paid. He was grateful. So he didn't want to be any extra burden. So when they told them, there's breakfast at this time, there's lunch at this time, then he just put it aside. I say, I came from Bible school, I was fast throughout. <laughs> and everybody would come out and they would go, they would go, he would like, hey, this was, you don't, you don't know we came for a spiritual exercise. You don't know. You are eating breakfast, you are eating lunch, you are eating dinner. And a guy was fasting, fasting, they didn't send him. <laughs> you know it's very hard to fast 30 days and learn 30 days. You know it's hard to be learning while fasting for a whole month. It's unnecessary. You will gain one, but you will lose the other. Certain things will not stay because those two exercises are not exactly compatible over a long period of time. So they will wake up, they will go, you say, bro, Dave. <laughs> you say, no, 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 no. You can, you can see. And he was feeling spiritual. More spiritual than them. Out of an ignorance. After this message, I'll go back to Abuja. <laughs> I don't see. I'm going back. It's 
see, they are clapping because they know I'm the only one that can say this thing. That's why they are clapping. You want to put me in trouble. I'm going back. Ready the car, ready the driver. We ride at noon. We ride at noon. Then sometime towards the end, he had fasted, he had learned. He was ready to come and explode in Nigeria. <laughs> he, he did, he did. He was ready. And they told him, ah, we're really concerned. You never show up at dining table. You, never, you don't even know what it looks like. You didn't even come to check. What is the problem? He said, ah, we're already blessed. We have victory. We came to Singapore. Haggai Training Institute. Paid. How could we have? We are, celebra- we are busy celebrating the victory. I'm happy. I'm so happy I'd rather stay in the room. I'm not, I'm not creating any extra ex- expense. Who knows, maybe at the end of the day, they will go and check the meal tickets and see what every pastor ate and use it to decide who will be qualified for something or not. Because we are in school, we can't tell what they are using to train us. So let's exercise the best caution because you don't know what is leading to. And he said, ah, sir, whether you use it or not, if you went to the dining table, you would discover that it's buffet. Nobody is counting your cost. It's buffet. Nobody will separate your receipt. We all have access at the same time. Our victory brought us to Singapore. Our triumph takes us to the table. And so you are victorious in places you are not triumphant. Because you have accepted that he finished it on the cross. But the due diligence that imparts revelation to your spirit. So that when you stand face to face with the enemy, they will be smelling the smoke from your fire. Not fear from your heart. The smoke from, from what has crystallized in your spirit. You don't have it. So you know all the memory verses. You know all the victories, not the triumph. So after the, the, war, the warrior has gotten his, his, his victory, he goes and looks for triumph. He's not done without triumph. He organizes the triumph ceremony. That's why you discover that in the Jewish nation, every covenant with God is celebrated by a feast. You don't enter dimensions in the spirit without celebrating into it. Eating into it. There is a meal. They know it in the occultic. We don't. You are not inoculated into a new level until you have eaten something the smaller ones didn't eat. That's why we got the blood and the body of Jesus. So that after he did the victory, we can feast in the triumph. So many of you are saved, but weak and sickly and die amongst you. Because although you believe, you do not discern the body of Christ. This conference is inviting us to go beyond victory and to enter a system of triumph. Let me say this last before I go. If you know anything about God and the ceremonies that he invites people for, when God starts a feast, it never ends. It is men that have opening time, closing time because resources are finite. When the infinite invites you to a table, there is opening time as a proof that his resources are without. When you are done, you can go. What am I trying to tell you? The victory was a spiritual static. It happened once, but the triumph is a procession. It goes on forever. The way to get the blessing of the victory is to enter the triumph celebration. That's the power of faith. Have you ever read a scripture you've always known and something jumped on you? Have you? You've always known it. But this time you read it and it was like, as he spoke to me, the spirit entered me. What happened is that you have invited into, you were invited into the very experience, the very spirit of that thing that you have read. Beyond the letter. I'm saying that there is a 
If it is healing that you, are, that you need, you can enter the procession of your healing and be healed. Many of us get great blessings on Sunday, but we lose them on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and we force the pastors to start again on Sunday where we dropped off last Sunday. Because after a powerful moment, many of us don't know how to reproduce that same atmosphere in our personal lives. So very soon, your pastor becomes an idol because you, you have not learned the personal culture of pressing into the triumph. That triumph where he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. I hope you know that that rendering in Ephesians starts first in Psalm 68. And it is a military man that is speaking, speaking about prophesying the, the, the triumphant procession of Jesus Christ. Remember this conference started where our father said that in the triumphant procession, Jesus demonstrated triumph. He foretold of triumph before victory. It was prophetic. He was still going to come and do another triumphant entry from Hades into heaven. But to foretell of it, he had a triumphant entry into Jerusalem, the gates of Jerusalem. So that when we receive his blessing, we don't only take what he did at the cross. But we press in for a triumphant procession. I'm looking for better words to tell you on my way to my seat. That there is a practice that makes you more than conqueror. Everything you are and you have in Christ is already on display. You get it by entering the party. Entering the feast in your spirit. As you fellowship with the Lord... I want you to learn the culture of receiving the blessing. Seeing yourself in the blessing. Entering into, because the Bible says it was at the triumphant, it was at, when he led captivity captive that he gave gifts to men, the gifts of men. The gifts of everything that we need are released in the triumphant procession. This is where faith gets its power. Faith is a conversion system from victory to triumph. You feel weak in your body. But the script says that you are victorious. So you organize a triumphant party for it. That attitude of shouting, I am healed, when you are feeling weak, it's not, it's not a victory. It's, a tri it's triumph. You are exercising triumph because of victory. Are you still there? That ability to stand up and say you are strong when you feel weak because you know that the book says that you are victorious over weakness is your opportunity to move from victory to triumph. This is where praise gets its power. The ability to praise God in the middle of the storm is the experience of triumph. We need to take all our victories to triumph. Many of us are waiting for the big thing to happen to thank God. That's, that's what conquerors do. They wait to win before they raise the trophy. There is another badge of people that have emerged. We are fighting from victory. We're not fighting for the victory. We have all the victory. The victory is our standpoint. Triumph is what we are fighting into. Are you still there? Yes. So every word that proceeds from the altar, everything that the Lord will say to us, we're entering very strategic, prophetic seasons, even in this conference where the word of God will become more and more specific as we approach Sunday. A lot of the victories that you have will be displayed for you and the opportunity will be given to you to triumph by it, to celebrate it, to release your faith, to act on it, to insist on it, to persist by it, to meditate on it, to refuse every other voice that says anything to you except what the victor said. Will you take that opportunity? Lift your hands and say, Lord, I will move from victory to triumph. This is my season to experience triumph. I will never be the same again. Every victory I have, I will triumph by it. 
in the name of Jesus. Everything my heart believes, my hand will handle. I am victorious and I am triumphant. I am more than conqueror. Somebody give a more than conqueror shout to God. Come on, give a more than conqueror shout to God.